last time when I came on here, we talked about, you know, grace in the marketplace. And uh, basically, you know, we, we, we laid a little bit of a foundation uh, with that concept, Grace in the Marketplace, which is really a book that God gave me in 2016. And uh, around his grace, uh, not just uh, to be, you know, uh, functioning within the walls of the church, uh, but for his grace to be something that we can take with us uh, wherever we go and use it, take advantage of the grace of God uh, in all our different uh, spheres and areas of influence. And so we, we shared uh, some nuggets, we shared some, some foundational principles, and from that same foundation, if you didn't get an opportunity to check it out, please uh, do so. I, I noticed that it's on Facebook, so you should be able to do that as well. Uh, but from that foundation, we established a few things, and uh, we're going to go back and revisit a few other things uh, that we established in our last class so that we can uh, build on that. The first thing we established was that the grace of God is uh, multifaceted. You know, the Bible talks about the uh, variety faces of the grace of God. And so the grace of God is as many faces, if you will. The Bible says we must be stewards of the manifold grace of God. So manifold means many faces. And so the church really, when you say grace, we are really almost all of us established in the uh, saving power of God, which is another face of the grace of God, uh, the saving grace. That's what I like to call it. Uh, but there's also uh, uh, the grace for the marketplace, you know, the grace, uh, the fuel to help us do what God has called us to do. We shouldn't be doing it in our own flesh, in our own strength. We should be doing it uh, fueled by the grace of God. And so I like to call the grace of God the octane for your assignment. It is the fuel that you need for you to be able to accomplish the things that God has called you to do. And our scriptural reference is uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 10. He says, but by the grace of God, the Apostle Paul talking, right? He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. So we become who we are because of God's grace. I am what I am, and his grace bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. And so we see here from reading, you know, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, that the Apostle Paul says the grace of God is what helped him uh, to do what God had called him to do. And he uses, uh, you know, uh, word pictures that are really powerful there. He says, if you read in the NLT, he says, I outworked the other apostles. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was bestowed upon me. So grace is our fuel for work, for creativity, and things of that nature in the marketplace. And so another foundational truth that we established is found in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. And I read in the Message Bible, and it says, God spoke and says, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature. So they, human beings, can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, and the earth, and uh, yes, the earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings. He created them God-like, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. God blessed them. And what did he say? He said, uh, pro uh, prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge, be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, and every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. And so we see here that the first words mankind ever heard from the mouth of God were prosper, because God wants us to prosper in the thing that he has called us to do. We defined that in our last class. And the second thing God said to mankind was reproduce. In other words, uh, take what I've given you and multiply it. This is why the instruction to Adam was, you know, uh, uh, be fruitful and multiply, increase on what I've given you. And so we established in our last class that everything from God is going to start as a garden. God could have planted the entire universe, but he decided to just plant a garden and put seed in it and gave it to Adam and say, now you take it and spread it all across the, the, the earth. And so that's what happens when we come into the business arena is that when God gives us these ideas, they come in seed form. You know, businesses always start small. You talk to any business people, they'll tell you, man, uh, things start small, but with, within it is the seed potential to grow 
and uh, impact the, the whole world. And so we see here, God wants us to prosper. He wants us to do well. And uh, uh, really, he wants us to, 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 to be influential so that we can, we can bring city and nation transformation. That's what this prosperity is for. It is not for consumption, you know, just to consume on every lustful desire that you may think of. No, this prosperity is, is for impact. It is for transformation. It is so that we can change uh, uh, people's lives. And so today we're going to get a little practical about how we can actually tap into this prosperity long term so that we can, uh, like the Bible says, uh, live an inheritance for our children's children. You know, I really like things that are practical. You know, I, I, I'm not I'm not very deep. You know, I like I like practical stuff. I like stuff that you know I can work with, so we can get some fruit, get some results. Jesus said, "We we we shall know we shall be known by our fruit." He says, "You shall know them uh, by their fruit." So when the outsiders look at us, you know, they they're looking at fruit. They're not looking at how deep our theology is and how deep our doctrine is. It doesn't really matter if you don't have fruit. And so fruit is the is the is the language of the kingdom of God? Fruit is our evangelism tool, if you will. Uh, we have to get to a point where the branches of our lives are just laden with fruit. You know, whether it's family in a spiritual life, whether it's in the uh, business world, in the marketplace, what God has called you to do, all of this should be just laden with fruit. And so that's what we want to talk about today: how we can get into that place of fruitfulness uh, that's sustainable. And and God has called me to talk about the marketplace. You know, there are other areas that we should be fruitful in. But for me specifically, God has called me to talk about wealth and, and the marketplace and, and things of that nature. And so I travel all over the world uh, talking about uh, these things. And so we want to go quickly to Joshua chapter number five. Joshua chapter number five. And uh, I'm going to read uh, from verse 12. Joshua chapter number five, verse 12. And this is what it says. It says this. It says, uh, on that day, then the manna ceased. Uh, after they had eaten the produce of the land. And the children of Israel no longer had manna, but ate the food of the land of Canaan that year. And so we see a transition here that transpired, that happened as the children of Israel moved from uh, Egypt, slavery. They went into the wilderness on the journey to the ultimate destination, which was, you know, Canaan, which was the place that flows with milk and honey. But when they moved from slavery, they went into the desert. And, you know, when they were in the desert, they, they, they fed, um, God fed them with manna. They, 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 they partook of the manna, right? And so uh, manna is what I like to call devotional money. We, we're talking about the different kinds of money now. That's what we're talking about. And sometimes I feel like Christians uh, really uh, miss out on an opportunity uh, to participate in the marketplace because we don't understand this principle. We want to talk about the, the different you know, kinds of, of wealth. We want to talk about the different uh, types of money. So there was mana. Mana represents uh, what we call devotional money, right? Uh, mana is, you know, if someone walks up to you and they give you a thousand rand, praise the Lord. But really, mana is not going to be uh, your, 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 your means of building a sustainable wealth if you want to leave an inheritance for your children's children. We have to transition from manna. This is why the Bible says in Joshua chapter number 5, verse 10, that on that day, on the day that they set foot in the land that flows with milk and honey, on that day the manna ceased and they ate of the produce of the land. And so God transitioned them from devotional money to what I like to call transactional money. And so a lot of Christians, uh, traditionally we've been taught that when you give 100 rand, uh, you, it's going to come back to you, good measure, press down, shaking together, running over. And uh, true, it will come back to you, but they didn't read the rest of the verse. It says that it will come back to you uh, through man. It says, shall man give into your bosom? So how do men give into our bosom? Men give into our bosom two ways. The first one is devotionally. They just kind of give you, you know, we, kill it, we call it uh, a benevolent giving, free will offering. That's, that's, that's great. You know, sometimes you may need that, but that shouldn't be your strategy to build wealth. The, your strategy to build wealth is to create opportunities for what I like to call transactional money. This is why scripture says that uh, they ate of the fruit of the land. So God took them from manna 
to, to actually transacting. And if you look uh, a, thousand down, a, th a thousand years down the, the stretch, right, when Solomon came, the children of Israel built such a robust economy, fortified uh, to a point that Solomon never had a single war because at that point he now controlled the entire trade of horses and ammunition and th things of that nature. Why? Because he understood the difference be be between devotional money and uh, transactional money. Devotional money, again, is what we give to the Lord. It is, you know, benevolent. If someone gives you uh, an offering or they give you, you know, 100 grand, praise the Lord. But ultimately, what we should be uh, uh, focusing on, when we give, really, God will give it back to us. Good measure, press down, shake it together, running over. But it comes in divine connections. It comes in his favor. That helps us uh, to, to have more opportunities for transactional money to come into our lives. And so I want to encourage, you know, uh, uh, young people on this call to start thinking, you know, transactionally. How can I uh, build with this mindset of, hey, I have to move from devotional into transactional? Uh, in, um, in 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 uh, uh, in the early 1900s, you know, there was a gentleman, uh, George Clason. He wrote this book called "The Richest Man in Babylon," and there's a principle he shares in there that's really powerful. And uh, this principle uh, says this: it says when you are when you receive your income, right? When your income comes uh, into, into your account, he says you shouldn't live off of 100% of your income. This is uh, the, the, the basic cardinal rule for, 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 for building wealth is that you don't spend everything that come in, you live below your means. And so he threw numbers at it. He said, uh, the first thing you do is to give away 10%. This is what George uh, Clason say. And so some people fight you when you bring that up and say, man, you know, I shouldn't be doing that. You know, I'm under grace. It's a different covenant and so on and so forth. And they, sometimes they're right. But the truth of the matter is even if you talk to a secular uh, uh, um, author or a secular, you know, think tank or people, you know, in the secular world uh, that do any kind of leadership business training, they encourage you to give uh, something away, you know, from, from whatever you receive. And the principle is simply this. It is, it is when, you, when you become a hoarder, when you have a closed uh, fist, you can't really receive uh, more. The principle is if you go to Israel, uh, there is what they call the Dead Sea. There, some of you may have gone to Israel and have seen this. They have what they call the Dead Sea. What makes the Dead Sea the Dead Sea is simply this. You know, as the Jordan River flows into the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea has no outlet. That water that comes in from the Jordan River is, is just it, it's stagnant. It just it, it doesn't go anywhere. And because of that, uh, that water is, is dense and it's, 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 the, it's salty. It's very salty, that water, uh, uh, to the point that you can't sink anything to the bottom of it. Uh, and it's really, really, really itchy on your skin if you stay in it too long and it's really uncomfortable and uh, every, nothing can grow in it. Nothing can live in, in, in that uh, uh, Dead Sea water. And what makes it that is because it's just stagnant water. But when you understand that the principle of life, the principle of receiving so that we can give, we can uh, be a blessing. That's not what I'm talking about, but I'm just killing a sacred cow as we go to really what I want to talk about is that we can't really prosper with the mindset of, of, um, of, of hoarding. We can't really prosper. In fact, hoarding brings a scarcity mindset. The reason why people can't give is because they believe stuff is running out. And when you believe stuff is running out, man, you're going to hoard. And when you hoard, you're telling yourself, hey, I don't have enough. There's about to be a shortage. And the Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so easy. I'm not preaching about offering. I'm not trying to take an offering, but I'm just trying to help you have a, a different mindset around these things. A generosity mindset cultivates opportunities. When you have a generosity mindset in your heart, not just in, in the church, everywhere you go, you know, when you go out to eat with your friends, you got to have a gen generous, it's, it's a mindset, it's a way of thinking that, that elevates us to operate at a different uh, level altogether. And so, you know, uh, this is what he said, uh, George Clason, right? He said, you give away 10 and say, and he said the other 10, you, you really invest and you can split it up this way. 
the first five percent you invest yourself and the other five percent you find professionals i'm not a, a professional uh, by no means i'm not a, a financial advisor certified no so you can't take this as financial advice right this is preaching from god's word uh, but but this is what he says in the richest man in babylon is that when you take away 10 percent, you give it away the other 10 percent you invest uh, and you invest long term and, and part of investing as well is getting rid of debt, you know, uh, uh, getting rid of the, you know, you can use the snowball effect, Dave Ramsey, right? Start with the small debt, building up to the big ones. And really, we've seen people in our community, in our church, pay off mortgage debt in five to seven years. We've seen people buy properties and things of that nature, just applying uh, these principles. Ultimately, you can actually leave off of uh, 70 percent and give away 10 and invest 10 percent and invest another 10 percent now what you invest in is is completely up to you know you asking the holy spirit to show you uh what you're gonna in in invest in and so this is very important for us to understand and as we go out and 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 partake in the marketplace to realize that there is a blessing of god there is a grace for us to be in the marketplace god wants us to be in there so that we can transact and we can uh, uh change people's lives we can grow our businesses we can employ people uh that's one of the questions i like to ask people you know when they come to me bragging about how much money they have how many people do you employ you know how many families are you impacting with your with your prosperity you know i'm not interested about the car that you drive and all these other you know flashy things i want to know how many people you're impacting because ultimately that's what prosperity uh is for and so the second thing god tells you know us in in genesis was was that we must uh reproduce and god really has given us the ability to take little things and make them big and in our last class we talked about matthew 25 how the the master gave talents you know the one with five multiplied it to five the one with two multiplied it to another a uh, two which was four uh the one with one you know went and buried it and the master wasn't too pleased with him uh, but the instruction is what i want to revisit there the instruction that the master gave them was occupy until i come occupy until i come and so i want to suggest to you this morning uh, that god has creativity for his children i want to suggest to you it's a strong suggestion but we're going to show you through scripture that is valid uh, that god has innovation for his children you will find it in the bible i'm going to show it to you uh, in the bible that god has uh, a technology uh, that is waiting for his children the church to tap into because god hasn't called us to a ministry of copy and paste god hasn't called us to just see what somebody else is doing over there and then do the same god wants us to cut a new path amen god wants us to cut a new path and so even the way we do ministry the way you know i do ministry man i don't copy and paste i don't check to see what the person next door is doing I, I i tap into this innovation creativity that we're talking about and we're going to show you through scripture and man i'm telling you when you start tapping into it it changes everything why because i tell people we are no longer in the information uh, age uh, uh, in fact before just before the information age we were in an age where you know if you had the information Oh man, you were the king of the of the of the totem pole, right? You were right at the top of the totem pole. If you knew uh, uh, who the president of Ghana is off off of your head, I mean, the whole school knew. Man, this one is the one that needs to go to for for quiz. You know, I come from Zimbabwe, and so we used to have a national quiz. And I mean, if you were a, 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 if your mind was a, a storage facility like that, that's what I call it, right? If your mind could store stuff like that, man, they thought you were brilliant. But these days it's changed because I don't need to know who the president of such and such is. I can Google it, right? And so we are in a different space and we are in a space that I call the age of insight. We are in a place of insight. Those who can see beyond what everybody else can see in the natural, they're going to have an advantage. Now, this positions the church and Christians at an advantage. Why? Because we have eyes that can see you know beyond just this natural cosmic world and i'm going to show you through scripture how you can tap into it and start functioning at a higher place in your creativity in your innovation and and things of that nature so that you can be an impact uh to to the entire world i was traveling in june uh in the u.s and 
I traveled to a few ministries, you know, ministering. We went to Caris Bible College with uh, Andrew Walmack and spent some time there with them. And, and uh, uh, we went to Teradez Ministries with our good friends, Ashley and Carrie Teradez, and I was teaching there. And what was striking for me is that uh, every time I'd teach and, and people would come to me and they would say this, they'd say, you know, this is the first time I've ever heard this. And, and I, I thought about it. I said, this, this ought to be us in the marketplace when we bring our products. This, this, people should be able to say, man, this is the first time I've seen this product. And it's, it's making our lives different. It's changing the way we do things and so on and so forth. When we, whatever we do, whatever God has called us to do, he wants us to cut a new path. He doesn't want us to function at the level of just copy and paste. Amen. And so we're going to go quickly. I'm going to show you two scriptures and then we'll wrap it up. I'm going to show you two scriptures that talk about innovation. In the Bible, there's technology and innovation. So quickly, I want to read John 16, verse 13. <clears throat> John chapter number 16, uh, verse 13. And this is what he says. He says, how be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. For he shall not speak of himself, but of whatsoever he shall hear. That shall ye speak. Now watch this. He says, and he will show you things to come. Now you say that to an average Christian. You say that to an average Christian. You know, you say uh, the Holy Spirit will show you things to come. Uh, you know, they say, yeah, Brother Tafara, I totally agree. The Holy Spirit will show me things to come uh, with regards to, you know, uh, uh, religious, spiritual things. He will show me things to come with regards to uh, who the Antichrist is, who the 666 is. Yeah, you will show me things to come with regards to the end times. But I want to I want to submit to you, brothers, that uh, the Holy Spirit can show you things to come with regards to your business. The Holy Spirit can show you things to come with regards to your the, the trends that are your business is uh, uh, should be uh, going into the holy spirit can show you things to come with regards to your your everyday work the holy spirit can show you things to come with regards to your calling and your assignment the things that god has called you to do he is not just limited to just spiritual religious things and i know the church really uh, have put the holy spirit in a box uh, we like to call on him when we are within the falls of the church. Uh, we like to uh, uh, call on him just to give us a touch, right? Just give me a touch, a goosebump. But I want to tell you that the Holy Spirit is way more strategic than just a goosebump and a touch. I mean, if that's all you want, he's going to give it to you. But I'm telling you, man, you can go with the Holy Spirit into the boardroom. You can go with the Holy Spirit to work and ask him to show you some really cool things. And those things are the things that, that are going to help you uh, to, to take that business to the next level. They're going to help you to get a promotion. Those things are going to help you to advance in the things that God has called you to do. The Holy Spirit has, has insight. He has information. He will show you uh, the invisible things and, and, and make them a reality to you so that we as believers, as a community of, of, of Christians, can have an advantage. And this is the mindset we should approach our work. You know, this is, you know, I believe this is the reason why Jews have an advantage over, you know, all the other nations in the world is that when they approach work, they don't look at work as a secular thing. They look at work as a sanctified, sacred thing, just like going to attend a service at the synagogue. You know, in fact, the word they use there is called uh, avoda in Hebrew. It's the word avoda, and what it means, they use it all the time. It's one of their five uh, principles of life. And, and what they say is, my work is my worship. So they don't look at work as some, you know, ugly, dirty, stinking thing that's disconnected from what I do on a Sunday morning. No, they look at work as a spillover from Sunday morning. So after we, we leave, our, you know, church, the church building on a Sunday morning, man, we take the Holy Spirit everywhere that we go. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We ask the Holy Spirit to bring divine connections, you know, people uh, that can uh, 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 partner with us to go to the next level. We ask the Holy Spirit to bring favor. 
uh, with God and with man. We ask the Holy Spirit to, to do all these different things for us, to give us insight and direction and things of that nature so that we can advance our businesses, our assignments, the things that you know God has really uh, called us to do. So I want to encourage you uh, this morning to start taking advantage of the Holy Spirit. Don't just you know, I think about goosebumps when you think about the Holy Spirit. Start taking advantage of the Holy Spirit on Monday, on Tuesday. Listen, I, I did a, I did a, 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 a research at our church. You know, I just went around asking people, uh, uh, you know, what, what they thought that uh, the, the Holy Spirit could do for them just in general. And uh, I mean, it, almost everything that was on their list were had to do with you know, number one, problems. He, he will come and fix problems, you know. Uh, but none of them really looked at the Holy Spirit as someone who could help them on their job. That was that was scarcely mentioned. No, Nobody ever mentioned that the Holy Spirit can. Because genuinely, people don't think God can work a computer, right? They think, man, he's the ancient of days. <laughs> people don't think God can work a spreadsheet. People think, man, God, this is out of your league, God. But I want to tell you, man, when you realize that God knew about all these things right before he created the, the heavens and the earth, right before Genesis chapter number one, God already knew about the internet. God already knew about flying right before Genesis chapter number one. It's us who were slow. We only caught up in 1907 and, you know, started uh, uh, steering towards aviation and flying. God knew about it. Uh, since the beginning of time, it is mankind who have tapped into it, uh, uh, you know, 2,000 years, 4,000 years later. And so I want to tell you, man, when we start really taking time out to sit, meditate, and, and open our minds up to receive from the Holy Spirit instruction about our Monday through Friday, not just about our Sunday, but about our Monday through Friday. There are people that God has called to be uh, apostles in the marketplace they they see things beyond you know what anybody else sees they see a structure beyond what anybody else is seeing there are people who god has called to be a marketplace uh, a prophet man they see in they see 10 20 30 years ahead of time i mean and, and we see some of them you know and i really believe all of this be belong to to God's children, that the world is really doing it at a much uh, higher level. But I believe God's children are the ones that are the real custodians of all these things. And so we have an advantage. Why? Because we have the Holy Spirit and these things are for us. I'm going to read another scripture that talks about, you know, innovation and creativity as well. In the Bible, there is a promise for innovation and creativity in the Bible. And it's Isaiah 45. And this is what it says. This is God speaking to Cyrus, right? A secular king. And this is what God said to Cyrus. That says the Lord to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue the nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two levered gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Verse 2, I will go before you, Cyrus, and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates uh, of brass and cut uh, in sander the bars of iron. Now, there are so many different interpretations of, or, you know, uh, Isaiah 45. You know, I was preaching at a conference uh, the one time, and, and, you know, this is a funny story. And uh, one of uh, the speakers there, Lance Wallnow, was preaching, and he thought that, you know, this was talking about Donald Trump. <laughs> But, you know, I'm, I'm from Africa, right? And I, I don't get into that kind of politics. But man, he was convicted. But I believe, you know, we can learn some stuff from this. And, and it is this, that, you know, this is God giving a promise to a secular king to, at the time, conquer and defeat uh, Babylon, right? So God is saying to Cyrus, uh, I'm going to help you conquer and defeat Babylon. Now, Cyrus is standing on the periphery of Babylon and is looking from the outside and is intimidated by what he sees. I mean, Babylon was the greatest technology of the time. And so Cyrus is looking from the outside and he's intimidated. He's thinking, man, there's no way I can better this. There's no way I can better what's happening in Babylon. I mean, they are the ones who came up with uh, 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 trade as we know it, you know, uh, uh, with the uh, uh, market forces determining, you know, the, 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 the prizes, you know, supply and demand and things of that nature. They are the ones who came up with irrigation. 
So Babylon was thriving at the time. And so Cyrus is standing on the outside and is intimidated. And God says to him, hey, you don't be intimidated by this. This is just a crooked path. I will make the crooked path straight. In other words, what the Lord was saying to him was this. I'm giving you uh, a promise for innovation. And the reason I say that is because the shortest distance between any two points, uh, you know, they used to say the shortest distance between any two points is a straight line, right? But I changed it. The shortest distance between any two points is innovation. You can say, you can go and tweet that and say, <laughs> Tafara Butai say that. The shortest distance between any two points is innovation. Think about it. Uh, before flying, the shortest distance between Cape Town and Joburg was uh, three weeks later on an animal drone cart. And, uh, you know, when people discovered a four-stroke engine, better known as a car, the shortest distance between Cape Town and Joburg became 20 hours, depending on the speed that you're driving, right? Uh, that was the shortest distance. And then when they discovered flying, the shortest distance now between Cape Town and Joburg is, is two hours. And so the shortest distance between any two points in life is innovation. The shortest distance between a cold meal and a hot meal uh, back in, in the 1900s used to be uh, you light a fire, you, you wait for it to, to catch on, and then you put your, your thing on there, and then you can heat up the, the food. The shortest distance has now become two minutes in a microwave. And so the shortest distance between any two points or to solve any problem is innovation. And so God is giving the promise of innovation to Cyrus when he says, I will make the crooked path straight. Things that should take two hours, I'm giving you a promise that it's going to take shorter. And so I want to submit to some of you who've been running your businesses well and you're doing exciting things and, and so on and so forth. I'm telling you, when God looks at that from heaven, we on down here on the earth, we may all be impressed. But when God looks at it from heaven, he's thinking this is a crooked path. I wish you could trust me for a straight path. And, and when you start trusting God for a straight path, man, he will give you innovation and you'll be able to uh, take things to the next level. I'm going to share one story with you that highlights what I'm talking about. You know, and it's in Genesis 29 um, from verse 1 to 15. This is after Jacob, you know, took the blessing, you know, from Esau and he took off. He knew that the blessing, uh, God has blessed the work of his hands. So when he took the blessing, he went into the marketplace to actually do the work, transaction, remember? Tr devotional money, transactional money. You went into the marketplace to create transactional money, not devotional money. Money doesn't rain from heaven. You know, div uh, transactional money. So when he took the blessing, he positioned himself for transactional money. And what happened? Uh, he went out uh, again. I'm reading in the Message Bible, Genesis 29. Uh, from verse 1, it says, Jacob set out again on his way to the people of the east. He noticed the well out in the open field with three flocks of sheep bedded down around it. This was the common well from which the flocks were watered. The stone on the mouth of the well was huge, and uh, all of the flocks were gathered, and the shepherds would roll the stone from the well and water the sheep. They would return the stone covering the well. The reason they did that is because they didn't want, you know, their enemies to poison the well and then kill all of their animals. And so Jacob saw these guys and said, hello, friends, where are you from? They said, we're from Haran. He says, do you know Laban? They said, we do. Are things well with him? Jacob continued very well with him. And he said, they said, he is his daughter um, uh, with the flock. So Jacob said this. Now, Jacob is positioning himself for innovation. He's trying to get more into the day. He's trying to get more productivity. This is powerful. Listen to what he says. He says there's still a lot of daylight uh, left. Isn't it time to round up the sheep yet? Is it? So why not water the flocks and go back to grazing? So Jacob meets these guys at 12 noon, 12 o'clock in the afternoon. These guys had already finished grazing, but they were waiting for everyone else to get there at 4 p.m., so that they could open the well, so that the animals could drink. And Jacob is saying, come on, guys, we can double our productivity. Let's open the well now, get the animals to drink, go back to grazing. We can do double in the same time. But listen to what they said. They said, we can't. This is the mindset we need to get rid of uh, as we go into the marketplace, right? We can't. I call them we canters. 
when you say let's do this we can't Let, let's do this we can't you have a grace of innovation no i don't we can't we can't i call them the we canters right and 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 i tell people don't join their group <laughs> don't be a part of the we can't uh, uh ministries international be a part of the i can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, because you really can. They said we can't. Not until all the shepherds get here. It takes all of us to roll the stone from the well. Not until then can we water the flocks. While Jacob was in conversation with them, Rachel came up with the father's sheep. She was the shepherd. Uh, and the moment Jacob uh, spotted Rachel, the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, saw her arriving with Laban, he went and single-handedly, the, the we can't as we're saying, no, we can't. We all have to do it. He went and single-handedly, right, rolled the stone from the mouth of the well and watered the sheep of his uncle Laban. Then he kissed Rachel and broke into tears and told Rachel that they were related. Now, if you read the rest of the story, you'll know that uh, Jacob, when he finally met, at, he did all of this as a volunteer. He didn't have to wait until he got paid for it. Some of the things you... Man, you just have to do more than what you're paid for if you're going to get a promotion, if you're going to get an increase. I want to talk to the young people. If you're going to get promotion, you, you don't get promotion because of the time you've served. You get promotion because you increase your capacity to do more than what you're, what you're paid for. If you start doing functioning at a higher level, doing more than you're paid for, man, you're going to get promoted and, and, and promotion will come and find you. And so we know Laban started doing this before he had a contract. And after, you know, his father-in-law gave him a contract, served him for 14 years, learning about business, learning about how to run a business and things of that nature. And at the end of 14 years, he was released to start his own and he increased and so on and so forth. And he became a giant uh, in the marketplace. And so this was my time and uh, it's 22 now. And so I'm going to stop right here, man. I could go on for days, but I'm going to stop right here so that I can turn it over back to uh, Brother Tariro. And uh, he will wrap it up for us. Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening. God bless you all. Wow. Thanks so much, uh, 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 Pastor Tafara, for a wonderful message. Uh, lots of stuff. I need to listen to it over and over again just to pick up uh, uh, the important nuggets that are coming from there. Uh, at this moment, uh, I'd like to invite the men to, to post their, co their comments or questions on the, on the chat group. I uh, also want to invite um, uh, my brother, uh, Felix Kagura, uh, uh, to moderate the questions, and he will be in conversation with you. Thanks, Brother Felix, and thanks again, uh, Pastor Tafara. Brother Sosos, so thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much for, for opening in time and leading the session. And Pastor Taf, uh, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation um there's a lot of revelations there so let me let me invite the men to to post the comments uh in the chat and we'll discuss about them but pastor tough as, as the men are commenting i thought you said a lot of things that i've i've, I've profiled some of them i've never seen them in the bible um this last piece of scripture genesis chapter 29 is quite it's quite amazing i am i love to, I, to, to pick up my bible and just read this let me check what this man is saying is it written in the bible in the first place <laughs> and i am shocked that this man said let's wait for the other guys to come you know, there was a bit of structure right let's wait for the other guys it will open roll the stone this man sees russia and he can just come off and draw the stone <laughs> What was what was this man's motivation? I thought this was amazing. Yeah, I shared that. I shared that with our church, and and half of half of half of my eldership team thought it was the woman, <laughs> I, 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 and half of them were spiritual. They thought it was the anointing. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. But but I want to go. I will, I will, let me just read this comment, and I'll put one question to you as the other men. Um, I tell you, brother Tafaz was brother Tafaz says it was the power of a woman, but <laughs> I see ten ten is looking for for a recording. Yes, uh, our, our 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 tech team is recording this, and they will they will they will avail this. I want I wanted to go back to your statement there. You you spoke about uh, the shortest distance between any two points is innovation, and and I thought that was profound. That actually is 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 true. You know, you gave a number of of good 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 examples there, but. My question is, how do we as Christians become innovative or what is our, um, our, our advantage or how do we leverage it? And I'm saying, what I'm trying to say is, 
how how do we become more innovative as Christians? You know, in in the marketplace, innovation is seen as almost it's almost mystic. It's almost just the guy who's got it just has got it. The guy who doesn't have it, unfortunately, doesn't have it. But but the the, 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 the thesis you put in front of us this morning is. As Christians, we have an advantage in the capability to be innovative. My question is, how do we access that? How do we get there? Yeah, I think, you know, for us, we have the Holy Spirit is, a, is the great advantage that we have. If you go into the Old Testament, you will realize that, uh, you know, most of the Old Testament saints that fought wars uh, did it in an innovative way. And everywhere it would say, then the hand of the Lord came upon them and they did this. Uh, when he says the end of the Lord is talking about the Holy Spirit. When you look at uh, Joseph, you know, how uh, he was innovative with even interpreting the dreams uh, that uh, he, he was asked to interpret. Uh, you look at uh, Daniel as well. You know, he was one, of, he was 10 times wiser and all of that came from, uh, uh, you know, the advantage that we get from the Holy Spirit. And so I think the first thing we need to do is not to relegate the Holy Spirit to just religious things that happen on a Sunday morning. We've relegated him to just goosebumps and really good feelings, and we don't take him with us to the marketplace. Um, there was a gentleman in the uh, 1900s in America, a black guy called George Washington Carver. I like to study these guys, and uh, he was a black guy, and um, he was disadvantaged at the time because of a lot of discrimination, but because he had a relationship with the Lord, he would get into a room with a blank piece of paper and say, Holy Spirit, show me things. And uh, he was innovative to the point that he single-handedly liberated the economy of the South, George Washington Carver. Uh, I mean, from a peanut, he used a peanut to come up with over 200 products, you know, from face powders to protein supplements and things of that nature. Uh, a black man, disadvantaged by discrimination, came up with all of these different products that liberated an economy of an entire region because he decided to partner with the Holy Spirit and listen. And so sometimes as a charismatic group, right, we are the charismatic people. When we go into the prayer closet, we do the most of the talking. And I want to suggest that we do most of the listening. You know, sometimes we just need to chill out and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to us, get a piece of paper and write, write whatever he, he shows us. And uh, man, the Holy Spirit, when you partner with him, he'll make you look good. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think that's a, that's a profound statement there. That a lot of the times we um we are we are we are very conversant with the Holy Spirit and we are happy to engage with the Holy Spirit on spiritual issues. But when, when we go out there, we, we are not we are not proactive or we are not we are not ready to listen to, to God talking to us about things in the marketplace. So thank you so much for that challenge. Um Brother Gandiwa says powerful stuff there, Pastor Tafara. May we learn more on the Holy Spirit. May we learn may we learn to lean more on the Holy Spirit for everything. Deuteronomy 8, verse 18. And you shall remember that it is God that gives you power to get wealth. That power is the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Brother Gantiwa. You're fully aligning with, with the pastor there. I normally don't take hands, but um, I think we have a bit of time and opportunity. Brother Blessing has got his end up. Uh, Mr. Mtambara, over to you. I'm not too sure if he can hear me. Uh, Brother Blessing, uh, do you want to take it? Okay, something something is uh, uh, is happening, brother. Blessings. I'll try, brother Andrews. Brother Andrews, over to you. Brother Andrews. Okay, so something seems to be happening. Okay, Sorry. Go. Yeah, I'm just uh, uh, for a background. I'm working for a company in in, in, in northwest, in fact, in Clagstop, a north a northwest region which is actually in, uh, intending to produce um, a vaccine that will actually kill a virus within the human body. And uh, ever since I started with the company, I, I had to give two, I mean, three innovations for the company. And people were saying, I'm, I'm a fool. Why didn't I ask the money? Because the project that they did, which was successful, uh, starting with the with a, t a TB, um, producing a tablet that would act was actually successful. 
um, um, I, I happened to be pressed by the Holy Spirit, who was actually giving me this of innovation, giving the success of the project. But the one that I'm currently in now, the Holy Spirit has been saying to me, ultimately, you will, you will actually bring forth uh, the, 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 pro the final product that you will actually um, get pension um, from that, because I'm I'm almost 62 years, whereby I'm pending to go for um, for pension. But uh, what I love about the, uh, the the teacher is this: I have not been aware that in all those innovations, the Holy Spirit was leading me through, and uh, and now it gives me the assurance of saying, I believe what ultimately will happen. I will give them the work that will be a pension to me. Thanks so much. Apologies, I struggled to come off mute there. Brother Tuff, do you have any, any comments there before I, I take the next question? Uh, Pastor Tuff, over to you. Yeah, I totally agree with my brother there, Andres. And uh, I think this is why, you know, this uh, uh, platform is really great because then you can uh, get some people here who are already in that space in the business world. They'll be able to help you to navigate uh, those uh, waters and yeah, I think it's a it's a valid comment. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Pastor Tuff. Um, a few points there, uh, brother brother Ehani John says thank you so much, Pastor Tuff, for such a great insight. I'm so blessed. Innovation through the Holy Spirit is an exciting news and quite so activating. Brother Jeremiah says somehow even as Christians complain on Mondays, pro 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 proving the point that we don't like our jobs. Where is the idea of hurting our jobs coming from? Then there's a good question from Brother, Brother Masimba. So if Brother Masimba Gotosa says, how do we effectively move from work or business, just being a source of income, to worship God as the Jews do? Yeah, I think this is what we were talking about when we said, you know, this is why I called this book Grace in the Marketplace, right? Because we, we just need to realize that what we do on Sunday is great. It's a celebration, but it must spill over into all the other different areas of our lives. And so it's a shift in our thinking. It's a shift in our mindset uh, that to realize that there is really no difference between the secular and the sacred uh, when it comes to our assignments, what God has called us to do and our jobs, really, our sacred, you know, church is 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 together is just merged together with the with the secular so-called secular but which is really sa sacred because all of our work the bible tells us colossians 3 23 whatever you find your hands to do do it as unto the lord so everything we do is is worship to god and so yeah it's a it's a shift in our mindset but that's a good question there Great, thanks, thanks so much. Um, I see there was a comment from Brother Stan, Stan the man. Um, br Brother Stan, I see you're, you're looking for being part of our mailing list. We do have uh, two WhatsApp groups. So just uh, you're welcome to, to drop your number there or contact any of the leaders, and then we'll add you to the, to the group and you, you won't miss any, any session. But Pastor Tuff, I wanted to come back to you. You mentioned at the beginning and at a point that I thought was profound, and, and you, you, you quickly moved on from it. But you said the success or the prosperity that we get is not for our own consumption or our own indulgence. It is, it is for, 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 for preaching the gospel. It is for, for, for passing on the, the message of, of, of God. Can you please elaborate how or what we are expected to do on an ordinary day when we are successful? I don't know, at work, in the marketplace, in our businesses and the like. What is the right response of a man when that happens to, 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 to him? I think the first thing is to think long term, you know, that uh, uh, the Bible talks about generations. It talks about, uh, you know, when the Bible talks about the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, it's just showing us how, uh, you know, God is, our God is a God of generations. He wants to, uh, he wants our influence to go uh, beyond just our existence. It has to go beyond uh, into the next and the next generation. That's why the Bible says we live an inheritance for our children's children. And so that mindset of, of thinking that way will help us 
to 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 shift our focus from consumption i mean god is going to bless us you definitely need to live in a nice house you definitely need to uh, drive a nice car and things of that nature but that's not the destination that's not the ultimate goal the ultimate goal is to impact generations beyond just just us an average company in japan is built to last 300 years just an average company if you go and see a a food uh, little tuck shop at the corner in japan the mindset of that owner is 300 years in fact the oldest hotel in the world was built in ad uh, 81 i may be mixing it a 71 or 81 it's still in existence uh, today i mean this is we're talking 2000 years later and so uh when we start these businesses i think the goal has to be impact it has to be legacy it has to go beyond just you know buying the latest iphone uh it has to go beyond that so that we can uh really change the the the, the pathway for the future generations that are coming so that they can have a, a better track to run on and so it, it's really a long-term thinking a long-term mindset and it's it's tough when you're coming from from where I came from, you know, the, we call it the uh, five process towards legacy, right? I came from struggle. So it's, it starts at struggle. When you're coming from struggle, I mean, the next thing you need to get to is stability, you know, and they forget legacy when you come in. So there's five steps that we put in our classes, in our trainings is you move from struggle to stability. And after you move from stability, you go to success. And after you come from success, you go to significance. And after you move from significance, you go to legacy. And these phases of life, uh, you, you can't, you know, uh, uh, sprint through them. You know, my mentor always told, tells me, Tafara, it's a long game, it's a marathon. And he told me, he told me, uh, I met with him in June and he told me, he said, man, you're only, you, you're only on the first phase of your life. You haven't even reached the third phase of your life. He said this to me, he said, you only reach the first, the sec third phase of your life when you get to your 60s, 65, you know, 70s. So I'm saying this because I don't want guys here to try and do it over a weekend, right? <laughs> to try and get, I mean, it's a, it's a marathon, right? So I just had to throw that in there. <laughs> That's 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 an important one. Thank, thanks so much for for giving us, us those um those changes. Um, um it's you remind me of of um when when you when you spoke about them, you know the, the the legacy, the longevity of that um that that example that you gave gave for for Japan. I, I a few a few a few years back, I I, I was I was doing it was not proper research, but I was just looking around for institutions that are African. Or yeah, businesses, institutions that are more than 100 years old. So in South Africa, in particular, there's quite quite a couple, a lot of these big businesses. I don't know, uh, Standard Bank or Mutual and the like. But when I restricted it to say institutions that were started by black people, so I was a bit bit racist there, by black Africans that that have done more than 100 years. I I got the ANC, which celebrated 100 years recently, and and I don't have a lot, many many others. So I I think that. It's a it's a challenge that that we have and 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 we we do and there, there are also a couple of chieftainships and kings and the like the kingdoms that are that are hundred years I mean you you could talk about them the 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 Zulu kingdom and a few others but beyond that it's quite it's quite difficult so I think it's a mindset that we need we need to take and and get and make sure we 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 we, we run with and make sure that we are there's one question that uh, that that came from Mark okay he says. Repeat the phases, but but I see Christmas on the day has already put them. It's struggle, stability, success, significance, and and uh, and legacy. So so hopefully you can um, you can do that. Um, so legacy, positive, legacy would... is what. So legacy is basically this. Think about it this way: uh, what what will people think when they hear your name a hundred years from today? <laughs> I like that question. I, I I think I think for a lot of people when they hear that name, they will not even know it. <laughs> Great, brother brother blessing says a very profound message. Thanks, Prof. Pastor Taff. You are encouraging us to be innovative and create new paths rather than continued adoption of the cast and paste methodologies. Methodologies. What do you think we ought to do to seriously tap into the innovation realm? Prayer fasting what else 
I think, you know, uh, a Christian, you know, we're really, we're very good at complicating things, but I'm going to simplify this and it's, it's going to be unreal. You just, you know, spend time with the Holy Spirit and listen to that inward uh, uh, witness that the Holy Spirit gives you uh, and, and, and man, act on it. You, you may, I mean, when I wrote my book, Grace in the Marketplace, it's got full of, it's full of nuggets that I'd never heard anyone teach. And I've listened to a lot of teachers. And uh, sometimes I would write it down and think, this is crazy. How am I going to preach this? I'm just a boy from Zimbabwe, Mbizo, Kwekwe, you know, uh, who grew up in a three-roomed house, you know, and how am I going to teach this to the world? And God told me, he said, man, you start preaching this, I'm going to make you a, a voice to the world. And I've traveled all over the world and people want to hear this over and over again. And so uh, I, I'm saying this to say, when God starts showing you things, it, it may look crazy in the beginning, you know, and you may look like a fool in the beginning for wanting to go in that direction. But as you start to spend more time with the Holy Spirit and you get more comfortable just hearing him and, and uh, spending time with him and, and, you know, making moves when he says, do it, um it's really fun it's really fun I, I like to have i like to take the holy spirit everywhere i go whether i'm playing golf i ask him is this the right club and i'm, I'm taking the holy spirit everywhere you know so it's fun when you start to do that with him it's just awesome it's like a living functional relationship with the holy spirit that then makes it easy for when we get to the big decision now the problem we have is we pack him in a shelf uh, for when we want to make the big decisions. But by then, we are not trained enough to hear from him. So all I'm saying is train your, 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 yourself, your senses, to hear the Holy Spirit every single day of your life with everything that you are getting yourself involved in. You know, ask the Holy Spirit to, have you, to help you uh, when you're working a spreadsheet at work, when you're doing your, uh, your, your normal duties, ask the whole, try and involve him in everything that you do and listen to him. And sometimes you may miss it. And sometimes you may hear him and think it's just you because when he speaks to you, he's speaking with your own, uh, uh, uh you know, vocal faculties. And it may sound like you, it, it, man, that's just me. No, it's him. He's speaking to you from the in, inside of you. So sometimes it may sound like it's just you, but as you get yourself in tune with him, it becomes easier and easier as you progress. So it's as simple as listening to the Holy Spirit and spending time with him. Now, is prayer important? Prayer is important. Is fasting important? Fasting is important. But I believe that the game changer is, is you know, the witness of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us because unbelievers don't have that, but we do. With the Holy Spirit inside of me, I can sit in a boardroom and in the spell of the moment, he can give me words to speak. He did it with uh, Moses, right, to Pharaoh. Pharaoh and Moses were in the boardroom negotiating the release of the children of Israel. You know, it was a boardroom situation, right, uh, but in the government space. And uh, the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to give you what to say in the spare of the moment. You trust me. You depend on me. And all Moses needed to do was to just listen and say, listen and say, listen and say. And sometimes that's what we need to do to just, you know, uh, uh, change, change this. Thanks. Thanks so much. And that's, um, that's, that's very helpful. I have a follow-up question on that, but just before I get to it, I see there's quite, quite a couple of discussions on the book. Uh, brother, brother blessing has said um, if uh, if someone needs the book, they can get in touch with him. Um, brother John, Ianyi John said, are those phrases taught in the book? Uh, these phrases are they are they are they um, touched on in the book? I've lost your voice there. I I, I don't know. It's on my side. Are you on mute? Sorry, sorry. That was, I was on mute. So I have about two books that talks about all these different things, and I'm not sure which one. And you know, <laughs> I don't read my my own books. So, so, <laughs> but you, you you know, yeah, it's somewhere, it's somewhere in there. You'll find some of the things that I was talking about in there. Some of them came after you know I'd already written the books. So yeah, I think, but the the bulk of the stuff is in the books. Great, great, great. I see, Doc, Doctor Dewey, uh Dr. Dewey is a is a is a cardiologist. He makes he makes quite a profound statement in the chat. He says that profoundly true. I take the Holy Spirit to theater when I do my cases, and I've seen him reveal things to me in those critical situations. 
That is powerful right there. I think all of us could learn from that. Indeed, indeed, that, that is powerful. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, um, Dr. Dewey, for, for that, that powerful word of testimony. And I can I, I want to say if Dr. Dewey does that in in the theaters, a lot of us are in situations where if we are wrong, no one will die. So I think we can <laughs> we can we can be we can do a whole lot more. But I want I want to touch on the point that you 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 spoke about right now when you know you you almost said it when you said it's me I'm a boy from Kwekwe from Bizo and the like and and but you have been in different places and we we a lot of us have got this um sometimes we 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 get the idea or the message or the inspiration from the Holy Spirit but but there is also an element of boldness required to. To, to, to execute, I always hear this joke, I always say, comment about this joke about a guy who said to his family, to his wife, I now want to be a politician, and the wife laughed and called the kids and said, this man cannot lead the three of us here to home, now he wants to lead the entire constituents of, of, <laughs> of, of 20,000 people, it, it kind of like just kill the confidence straight away. But my, my point, my serious question then is, how do we become bolder? A lot of, more bold to implement what we what we believe. I believe a lot of the times we we get the right idea, we get the right insight, we 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 see the opportunity, but a lot of the times we don't execute. How how would we how would we become more bold to go out there and do what we believe God is doing? And especially if it's innovative, it means it's different, it's unusual. How do we how do we do that? Yeah, I think it's it's gonna take um, you know us being radical in our approach to 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 responding to what god is it's almost like peter is sitting in a boat right and jesus says come walk on water there's about 12 other people that are sitting in in the boat with him 11 you know the disciples and uh, the boat is sinking that's what's interesting about that whole situation is that i mean what they are doing is not working already but only one says, you know what, I'm, I'm actually going to walk on water. I'm actually going to, you know, try and do something different. And uh, so I think as we, as we, as, but again, you can't just start with the big one. It's going to start with the small ones, right? It's going to start with taking the small risks. It's going to start with, you know, us. Uh, it's almost like learning how to walk. You know, you're going to have to uh, crawl before you walk, before you run, before you you know you fly and you jump so i think you know it's it's these small steps of faithfulness that we talked about in the last class that are going to help us to to grow in our boldness it's i'm definitely not saying in your 20s i know there may be some people in their 20s yeah i'm definitely not saying in your 20s you must quit your job and just try to you know fly you you're gonna crash uh but here's another thing that we also must think about is mentorship you know for for young people all of us in fact, I don't know, I, I'm still young, I think I am, you know, I'm in my 40s, but I value my mentors. I have uh, mentors for my marriage. We have people that mentor us for that. I have mentors for my spiritual life. We have people that mentor us. I have mentors for our business and investments. We have people that mentor us for that and tell us, you know, get, show us all these different things. And so I think, you know, mentorship is also one of the grossly underrated things in life. Uh, but I want to encourage you, if you're here and you're a young person, uh, think about finding, I'm not talking about manipulating people and conniving to try and get, you know, mentors so they can do something for you. I'm talking about pray about it and ask God to show you people that can help you along the journey. And uh, when you meet with those people, ask them questions, you know, ask them, don't go to your mentor with your business proposal and do all these, you know, things that, you know, you want to preach to them go to your mentor with the genuine sincerity of uh wanting to receive from them because the truth is they've already gone ahead of us they are you know two three hundred kilometers ahead of us and so when you spend time with people like that they'll be able to tell you hey there is a a, a blind spot here there is a sharp curve here you need to watch out for this and this and the other and so i think also mentorship is very important you know just understanding that the value of relationships and mentorship is grossly understated uh, these days. Young people don't value relationships, but man, I'm telling you, uh, mentors are, are, are going to help us. 
that's that's a profound that's a profound message there and, and i agree with you 40 year olds are still young i used to think that they are they're old before i turned 40 so i i agree with you but but i think we we, we still have a lot to learn as well so it's it's important to to do that i want to i want to come to my last question but i'm taking you back to the to the point that you said you touched when you were passing but i think it's it's an profound it's a profound point to our destiny and to our to our higher levels of our own versions you, you mentioned about you should aim to get to a point where you you are living off the 70 percent and and the 30 percent you you give you give buckets there so I, firstly i just want to to ask what are the the, the three tens that you gave there and and how do we encourage us to get there a lot of the times it's very difficult to get brethren to give 10 percent and and the, the 30 percent how do you well, how do you think is the pathway to get there yeah, so when I said live off of 70, I said, you know, you give away 10, right? If you are a Christian, you give it away to the church, you know, uh, it's going to cultivate something in your thinking. You know, I always say this, giving and having a generous mindset preaches a sermon to you, the giver. That's why Jesus said in Acts 20, 35, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. When you don't give, literally, you're also preaching another sermon to yourself. And so it's very important uh, for us to realize that we, we, we you know, uh, we, we, we do that. But the other 20, what I said was we, we you know, invest the, the other 10 and we invest uh, with a professional help and we invest the other 10 ourselves. And so that's, that's what the, the book said, you know, the richest man in Babylon, it was on 80%, five, you invest yourself, the other five, you get professionals to invest for you and um you know that they, they, they'll be able to do that brilliant brilliant thank you so much thank you so much that's that's very clear and i just want to encourage the, the men they they say the truth is like soap it only works when it has been applied so this has been very useful this has been very profound pastor tafara really appreciate you waking up early in this cold morning and teaching the men the word of god I'm sure this is not the last time we are hearing from you, but thank you so much for this morning. Thank you so much for ministering to the men. And uh, may God continue blessing you and increasing you and giving you more innovation and uh, revelation so that we can uh, we can also learn and benefit from you. Great. Let me let me let me close off by a word of prayer. Let's pray. Master, we thank you this morning. We thank you for the men who are on this line. We thank you for the families that are represented. We pray that you bless them, that you give them the courage to live the word that has been preached, that you give them the courage to go out and do as you have instructed. Master, we pray that you grow them to be innovative, to give, to live as you have instructed, even this morning and as you have instructed in your word. We pray for Pastor Tuff. We pray that you continue leading him, you continue teaching him, you continue speaking to him. We pray for his ministry. We pray Pray for his businesses we pray for his family that my god you continue cutting them you continue leading him to so that he can also continue shining and uh, being a leader in those places and even unto the world thank you for this day we pray for all the endeavors that we are going to work on for the remainder of the day that they be led by you in the name of jesus we pray amen